Can you see it properly now? Is it full screen? Yes, no, yes. Okay. So wait, I'll present you. So we are recording, yes. So Palina uh, is uh, currently in Berlin, not currently for a long, long time, unfortunately. <laughs> and she's a sociologist and uh, editor in Open Democracy. She's also, she just published her new book in Russian that you are reading now and you'll discuss this week. And uh, she is one of the world's best, uh, according to me, experts in law, precisely because uh, she knows the post-Soviet Union law. <laughs> and that's not the same as Western regime of romantic law, right, Palina? I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> you can start. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Unfortunately, I can't see your faces now because my presentation is blocking me the view completely. I don't know how to, uh, wait, I can, uh, yes, now I can see you, fantastic. So uh, I will try not to make it too long and to leave some space for questions and for the conversation. Um, Right, so I, I titled my lecture, Why Love is Not Free. I, it's, a, it's a provocative question because I want you to ponder on it while I will be talking and maybe this will be the question that I would like to discuss with you when I'm done. Do you think that love is free? Do you think that love is maybe free in some ways but not in the others? What is really freedom in love? How do you understand that? So I'm trying to provoke you here and let's get back to it um, after I'll finish the frontal lecture part. So, I'm sure you all know this video. Oh no, I can't show it in German. <laughs> While I'm in Germany, I can't, this is very silly. Um, anyways. I think we know. You all know, I don't have to tell you. So, um, one of the main insights about um, differences between post-Soviet understanding of romance and uh, at least the American or I did to generalize the Western understanding of romance has happened to me um, at the end of the 1998 or to be precise on the eve of the 1998 at the New Year's evening. Um, and I dare say that the cold war stomped right into my parents' living room in St. Petersburg. And it burst into our house together with an American exchange student who I had a bit of a crush on, let's call him Jesse. He was taking courses in the Russian language in St. Petersburg um, philology department. He was very proficient in reading his Chekhov and he even knew the difference between Nazdarovia and Zazdarovia, which I think is very, very important. So by inviting him home for the most sacral of all Russian feasts, uh, the new year, I was hoping to initiate him into the deepest corners of the Russian soul. And in particular, we were going to make uh, I'll have to say it in Russian, and watch uh, the, irony of, the Irony of Fate, the film that any Russian adult born after 1975 probably had seen at least 20 times. Um, so exposing Jesse to this um, film was meant to be pinnacle of his ethnographic expedition into our two-room apartment. And uh, um, I was very much hoping that it will end with us falling into each other's arms. My parents have tactfully retired to the kitchen. I took the strategic position on the sofa next to Jesse and turned the TV on, relishing amorous moments ahead. So the reason I wanted to show Jesse uh, this film and no other is not just because it's a New Year's drama, but also because it's actually, uh, it comprises all the existential ingredients of a Russian love drama. Alcohol, blizzard, steam bath, hijacking public transport between Moscow and Petersburg, and on top of that, state controlled housing and planned economy. And uh, um, um, there was also a very telling scene, uh, which I'm sure you all remember, uh, when Genia wakes up and Ippolita is already, he's showing up for the first time. And uh, then you have a face off between a drunkard and frayed boxer shorts against the rock of a man in a padded coat and a solid hat. And Zhenya sobers up, he plays guitar and he reads poetry, but Ipalit is not impressed at all. And uh, for people like you, he shouts at Zhenya, there is nothing sacral, nothing constant. You stick your nose into it everywhere. You believe not in reason, but in impulse. You are irresponsible. You only follow your feelings. 
you are a threat to society. And nothing can be a better description of a Russian lover par excellence. And this is precisely the reason why two hours later, Nadia throws Ippolit's photograph out of the window, drops her possessions and follows her new passion to Moscow into the unknown future, crowned with a fur hat, like it's right and proper for a Russian lady on the run. And I'm sure that all of you know that in the former USSR, the story of Zhenya and Nadia was considered to be a blueprint of love that overcomes everything, social conventions, geographical distance, protagonists' own uncertainties and cowardice. All hurdles are smashed and in a record time. The fate eponymous to the title of this story seems to be endowed not only with the sense of irony, but also the sense of justice. Those ready to sacrifice everything will be rewarded with existential bliss, the film promised. Even if up until that one decisive moment, they lived a life of utter unimportance. And year after year, catching a glimpse on Jenny and Nadia staring into each other's eyes on the screen, my mother would stop chopping the New Year's potato salad and my father would seize hovering pine needles off the carpet for a moment. A simple truth blinked to them from the TV. Love could tumble on anyone, any minute, and the only decent way of going about it was to grab it and hold it firm, whatever it costs. And feeling a pang of sweet nostalgia, they sighed, oh, love is such madness. This is madness, Jesse announced too as the final caption started crawling up the screen. He jumped off the sofa without having no intention of hugging me or falling into my arms <laughs> and declared, I have no idea why you Russians call this bullshit love. An infantile washcloth of a guy who still lives with his mom in his thirties, trespasses another person's property, treats you like shit and kicks out a perfectly decent boyfriend. This woman too has no sense of personal borders. Instead of calling the police, she feeds this alcoholic canapes she made for someone she promised to marry. And then she runs away with him, basically destroying her whole life. This is not funny, said Jesse. I'm sorry, it's just a lot of poor choices. You're heartless, I shouted at him. No, I'm just realistic, he replied and grinned. So, to summarize, I think what happened between me and Jesse that New Year's Eve wasn't just a date gone wrong. Um, instead, it was a kind of like a clash of civilizations, or to be precise, a clash of two invisible but vehement powers with powers we can call romantic regimes, systems of emotional conduct that affect how we speak about how we feel, determine normal behaviors, and establish who is eligible for love and who is not. And in our apartment in St. Petersburg, where you had to climb over books in which counts and officers, teachers and doctors, peasants and workers were killing themselves and others for love, with diaries of grandparents who followed each other into the battlefields of the Second World War were hidden in a box and where two adults with incurable diseases were raising their own child in our apartment, like in most other Soviet apartment, the romantic regime of fate was reigning. Based on understanding of love as a supernatural power, one succumbs to even when it's detrimental to comfort, sanity, or life itself. And this attitude comes perhaps from a knowledge that in our part, love is a very short-lived pleasure. It's an easy prey to wars, revolutions, and nuclear catastrophes, which have always been a very tangible possibility. And for many generations, love came to Russians as a short, passionate redemption. And if it later turned out their life to ashes of domestic violence, abortions, and several serial divorces, they weren't particularly surprised because no one said life was fun anyways. Where Jesse comes from, to be precise, from Cincinnati, Ohio, the United States of America, the opposed safety first mode of love has been in place for years. The mode fundamental to the regime of choice, where every individual is trained from making decisions about who to get intimate with, to rationalize their emotions in terms of needs and rights, and to reject commitments that do not seem to be compatible with them. And in an Anglo-Saxon tradition, sense and sensibility have been inseparable since at least Jane Austen's time. In making right romantic choices, from picking a date on Tinder to continuously evaluating um, a decade-long marriage is an essential practice through which the ego supposedly exercises its autonomy and reaches enlightened independency. Um, one second, I have to see how I skip this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Something is... Oh dear, oh dear. I'm very sorry. I was just going to show you the next slide. No. 
See, I'm not very technically savvy. So there you go. Let's just one more time, hold on to the, the definition of what is romantic regime. So romantic regime is... Now. Everything is all right? No, we can't see your slide. Sorry? We can't see your presentation. I mean, we can see... Okay. Your... One second, I'll... Uh, 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 uh. Sharing it again, maybe. One second, I'll try again. I'll try again. Oh, this is very strange. Second. No, it happens all the time with us. <laughs> This is faith as well. Yes. Um, I can't go back to Zoom for, for some reason. I can share your slides if you want to have them here. Sorry? I can share your slides if you want. Yeah, that would be great because for some reason I just I can't go back into uh, the Zoom window where which would allow me to share screen. I don't know why. Yep. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Can you move to the next slide, please? Wait. Not possible. Yeah. Fantastic. So romantic regimes are systems of emotional conduct that affect how we speak about love, how we feel, determine normal behaviors and establish who is eligible for love and who is not. And um, at first, the, the very concept of regime was introduced to a sociology of emotions uh, or research social social science about emotions by historian William Reddy, who was um, writing about sentimentalism. And he introduced the concept of emotional regime, where uh, whereby he is speaking about something very similar. He's suggesting that uh, we don't, we're not really free expressing our emotions because we uh, are always using a particular set of so-called emotives. And emotive is uh, a unit of performative action. So emotive can be a, a concept that um, describes your emotion or emotive can be a specific practice or specific uh, performative behavior. So for example, um, you know, the, the contemporary way of talking about relationships, for example, using concepts like toxic or abuse or gaslighting, those would be our contemporary emotives. This is how we pack. This is how we can, you know, those are little containers in which we put our experience and present it to the world. And so every historical epoch, every um, kind of society has its own set of emotives. And those emotives are building up romantic regimes or emo emotional regimes. Um, Julia, can you move to the next one, please? So, as I said before, just to repeat, um, the post-Soviet and this, the Soviet understanding of, of love and romance could be described, in my opinion, as a regime of fate, where love and, um, you know, emotional experience is being um, perceived as something that comes like a force of nature. And self-sacrifice is above self-interest and bonds are above autonomy. So you don't really control what is happening to you. You can't really, <clears throat> you can't really uh, calculate love. You can't even always express love. You can't really articulate it. Um, I don't know whether you remember a famous scene uh, in Anna Karenina where Levin is proposing his feelings to Kitty. He just writes a list of letters Basically, he is he he writes her a note, <laughs> which just has a list of letters on it, and she has to decipher it because these letters are the first letters of 
words, um, I love you and I want you to become my wife. And she is the one who is capable of deciphering it immediately. And from her capacity to do it, he concludes that she is the one for him. So there is the force of fate. There is a force of inexplicable. There is a force of unarticulatable um, at hand. And the regime of choice is based on a very, very different principle. It's based on the idea, Julia, can you, can you move forward, please? So uh, it's based on an idea that we can rationalize emotions, that we can instrumentalize bonds, and that we can actually, if we try really hard, we can get more out of love. We can maximize relationships. We can invest into relationships, and we can actually harvest the crops. Um, so both regimes are based on opposing principles, and both of them turn love into an ordeal in their own ways. And nevertheless, in most middle-class westernized cultures, including contemporary Russia, the regime of choice is asserting itself over all other forms of romance. And the reasons for this appear to lie in ethical principle of new liberal democratic societies, which regard freedom as the ultimate good. However, there is some strong evidence uh, that we need to reconsider our convictions in order to see how they may in fact be hurting us in invisible ways. And um, Eva Luz, one of the most fundamental uh, sociologists of emotions, she observes that if we are able and if we consider it appropriate to criticize the dictatorship of choice um, in economic and then political sphere, then we also should be able to do that in the sphere of sexual. And this is what I'm also trying to do in my work. But uh, let's go a little bit into a historical context in order to understand what choice actually does mean for us and how is it really entangled with our idea of freedom. <clears throat> Julia, can you move on? Can you, can you give us the next slide? Um, and then the next one. <laughs> Right, excellent. So to understand the triumph of choice in the romantic realm, we need to see it in the context of the Enlightenment's broader appeal to the individual. In the economics, the consumer has taken charge of the manufacturer over the time. In faith, the believer has taken charge over the church. And in Romans, the object of love has gradually become less important than its subject. Um, in the 14th century, uh, the Italian poet Petrarch was gazing at the golden tresses, the hair of his beloved Laura, and uh, she called her divine and believed her to be the most sublime proof of God's existence. And 600 years later, another man in Italy, bedazzled by a different heap of golden tresses, Thomas Mann's Gustav Aschenbach, concluded that it was he and not the handsome Tazio who was the touchstone of love. Um, Aschenbach thinks, the love, the lover, was nearer the divine than the beloved, for the God was in the one, but not in the other. Perhaps the tenderest, most mocking thought that was ever thought, and the source of all the guile and secret bliss the lover knows. So this observation from death in Venice encapsulates a great cultural leap that occurred somewhere close to the beginning of the 20th century. The lover has pushed the beloved from the sense of the attention. And the divine, unknowable, unreachable other is no longer the subject of our love stories. And instead, we're interested in the self with all its childhood traumas, erotic dreams, and idiosyncrasies. And examining and protecting this fragile self by teaching it to pick its affection properly is the main project of regime of choice. And this project is brought to fruition. It's instrumentalized um, by popularized version of psychotherapeutic knowledge. And here I really want to uh, highlight once again that I'm going to be talking about the popular version of uh, psychologized knowledge. I'm not going to be talking about um, psychotherapy as actually a face-to-face -face practice, but rather about the therapeutic discourse that we all encounter every day through mass media, through social media, um, et cetera. Um, Yule, can you please give us the next slide? So the most important requirement for choice is not the availability of multiple options. It's the existence of a savage, sovereign chooser, the subject, who is well aware of his needs and who acts on the basis of self-interest. And unlike all previous lovers who ran amok and acted like lost children, the new romantic hero approaches his emotions in a methodical and rational way. 
He sees an analyst. He reads or she reads self-help literature and participates in couples counseling. Moreover, he or she may learn love languages, read into neuro-linguistic programming, or quantify their feelings by marking them on a scale from one to 10. And the American philosopher, Philip Reeve, who also happened to be Susan Zondag's husband at some point, calls this type the psychological man. Reef describes him as anti-heroic, shrewd, carefully counting his satisfactions and dissatisfactions, and studying unprofitable commitments as the sins most to be avoided. So the psychological man, to put it shortly, is a romantic technocrat who believes that the application of the right tools at the right time may straighten out the tangled nature of our emotions. And this, of course, applies to both genders. We will talk a little bit about gender differences at a later point, but when it comes to neoliberal subjectivity, it actually encompasses both genders. So the psychological woman follows the rules, the same rules as the psychological man does, or rather the rules. Uh, Julia, can you give us the next one? The rules, uh, oh no, uh, maybe the next one? Are we there yet? Yeah. So. The rules, time-tested secrets for capturing the heart of Mr. Right by Ellen Fine and Sherry Schneider. So we have our own the rules uh, in the Russian speaking uh, realm. And I mean, this kind of bullet pointization of advice and um, bullet pointization of the subjectivity is a very um, typical feature of neoliberal um, understanding of, you know, how um, of um, self-management. Um, so it's not surprising that what happens in the English speaking realm is also happening in the Russian speaking realm. So we have our wonderful, brilliant example of Mikhail Lapkovsky, who also has, uh, I think, 10 rules of a successful woman. I cite them in my book. So if you're interested, you can uh, either Google up uh, Lapkovsky and look at it, or you can check it in my book. But for this presentation, I um, wanted to quote from a book, a self-help book, which probably had the it's among the most um, read, the most bought. It's the, one of the greatest bestsellers of all time in the American book market. The book called The Rules, How to uh, Time-Tested Secrets for Capturing the Heart of Mr. Right. So on this slide, you can see just a few of those rules, uh, such as don't talk to a man first, don't ask him to dance, don't stare at man and don't talk too much, don't meet him halfway, go Dutch on a date, don't call him and really return his calls. Always end phone calls first. So the premise of the rules is very simple because the men are genetically wired, as the authors believe, to chase women. If women show them even the tiniest degree of empathy or interest, this has the effect of upsetting the biological equilibrium. And it emasculates a man, apparently, and reduces women to the status of a miserable, abandoned she-animal. And the rules has been criticized for almost idiotic degree of biological determinism. And nevertheless, new editions continue to appear and the hard to get femininity that it advocates has become a commonplace of modern dating advice. And as we can see, it also has become commonplace in the Russian speaking world. And unlike in the US where the rules has really become a target of a lot of uh, criticism and memes and uh, sarcastic reaction, um, nothing like that is yet happening in the Russian speaking space uh, when we look at um, different advice that we see published in women's uh, magazines. So Lapkowski has not been under the same amount of fire as the uh, authors of the rules. So, but the question, the question is why does it remain so popular? What is so attractive about it? And the reason surely underlies in, uh, surely is in the underlying message um, of this book. One of the greatest payoffs of doing the rules is that you grow to love only those who love you, claim the authors. If you have been following the suggestions in this book, you have learned to take care of yourself. You are busy with interests and hobbies and dating, and you're not calling you chasing man. You love with your head, not just with your heart. So the same message is being transmitted in the Russian speaking space. The same message is being transmitted by Lapkowski when he talks about his 10 rules of a successful woman. His the premise of his advice is that um, unrequited love, unhappy love, love is not, is not being returned, is an illness. It's in neurosis. If you love somebody and they don't love you back, it means that you are mentally ill. Something must be very, very wrong with you. 
you haven't attended to yourself properly, you haven't optimized yourself properly, you have a neurosis, you need to see a therapist, you need to fix yourself, and then you will be ready for the bright new world where you will only have brilliant experience of mutual love and love can only always be um, requited. Um, so in the regime of choice, there's no man's land of love, the minefield of unreturned calls, ambiguous emails, erased dating profiles, and awkward silences must be minimized. No more pondering what ifs and why. No more tears, no more sweaty palms, no more suicides, no more poetry, novels, sonatas, symphonies, paintings, letters, myths, and sculptures. The psychological man or woman needs only one thing. Steady progress towards a healthy relationship between two autonomous individuals who satisfy each other's emotional needs until a new choice sets them apart. Yulia, can you give us the next one? Right, okay, we still have to get there. But um, so the, the triumph of choice in the philosophy, like in the, in the understanding of love is also reinforced by social biological arguments. And love long captivity in a bad relationship, we're told, is for Neanderthals. Um, Helen Fisher, the world's most famous love researcher, she is the person behind the match.com. She is the, she's the anthropologist, she's probably the richest anthropologist on earth. She's somebody who has a degree in cultural anthropology and who is actually working for match.com to develop um, algorithms, helping them develop algorithms for matching people and creating couples. So she suggests that we have outgrown our agricultural heritage and we no longer need monogamous relationships. We're now evolutionarily impelled to seek different partners for different needs, if not simultaneously, then in different stages of our lives. And Fisher celebrates the modern lack of pressure to commit. We should all ideally spend at least 18 months with somebody to decide whether they're good for us and whether we make a good match. With the absolute availability of contraceptives, unwanted pregnancies and disease can be fully eradicated, childbearing is fully disengaged from courtship, and so we can take the time to give our potential partner a test drive without feeling the consequences. And uh, you could say that compared to other historical conventions about romance, the regime of choice may seem like a, it's like a, it's like a vortex jacket. It's like, an, like, a, like the Germans say the function, the function coat, you know, it's like a sports jacket next to, to, to a hair shirt. And its greatest promise is that love needn't cause pain. And um, uh, I really like this quotation from the French uh, philosopher Alain Badieu, where um, he says, if you have been well-trained for love, following the canons of modern safety, you won't find it difficult to dispatch the other person if it ensued. If he suffers, that's his problem, right? He is not part of modernity. The same way that zero deaths apply only to the Western military, the bombs they drop kill a lot of people who are to blame for living underneath. But these casualties are Afghans, Palestinians, they don't belong to modernity either. Safety first love, like everything else governed by the norm of safety, implies the absence of risks for people who have good insurance policy, a good army, a good police force, a good psychological take on personal hedonism, and all those risks for the opposite side. So um, Laura Kipnis, uh, an American um, cultural, cultural studies person, she's also an anthropologist and um, a sociologist. She has a fantastic book called Against Love. And she says, she suggests that the only suffering that is available in this romantic regime is the supposedly productive strain of working on a relationship like tears shed in couples therapy and wretched attempts at, at marital sex and daily inspection of mutual needs, etc. So you're allowed to have sore muscles from working on your relationships, but you cannot have accidents. This is illegal, this is illegitimate. And by making heartbroken lovers into the authors of their own trouble, popular advice produces a new form of social hierarchy, an emotional stratification based on misidentification of maturity with self-sufficiency. And this is why, according to Eva Luz, the 21st century love still hurts. So first, we lack the legitimacy of those love-torn dualists and suicides of the previous centuries, 
who enjoyed social recognition based on the general understanding of love as a mad and explicable force that not even the strongest minds can resist. And from the perspective of the regime of choice, all those heartbroken Emmas and Annas of the 19th century, they are not simply inept lovers, they're not just simply unprofessional at love, they are psychologically illiterate, if not evolutionary passe, they're just like evolutionary, evolutionary trash. Uh, Mark Manson, a relationship coach with more than 2 million readers online, and his work has been also translated into Russian recently, he writes that romantic sacrifice is overrated in our culture. Show me almost any romantic movie and I'll show you a desperate and needy character who treats themselves like dog shit for the sake of being in love with someone. So the main message uh, is that you are always enough. You need to be able to, uh, to survive without other people. You need to be able to be sovereign enough, uh, not needing any bonding, not needing any commitments, not needing any attachment. And in the regime of choice, committing oneself too strongly, too early, or too eagerly is a sign of an infantile psyche. It shows a warring readiness to abandon self-interest so central to our culture. Um, and second, and even more importantly, the regime of choice is blind to some structural limitations that make some people less willing or less able to choose than others. And this occurs not only because we have unequal endowments of uh, what some sociologists call erotic capital, which means that not all of us are equally pretty or sexy, but the biggest problem is that choice is that whole groups of individuals may actually be disadvantaged by it. And in particular, um, this, this is where we can talk about gender differences, and this is where we can talk about gender disparities. And Eva Lewis has argued very persuasively that the individualistic appeal of the regime of choice tends to cast the desire for commitment as loving too much, and that is loving against one's own self-interest. And although enough broken-hearted men are pathologized for their neediness and inability to let go, it's mostly women who fall into categories of codependent and immature. And across class and race, they're trying to make themselves self-sufficient, not to love too much, just to celebrate themselves like in the rules above. Um, so the trouble is that a bubble bath can't substitute for a loving gaze or a long awaited phone call. And the greatest gift of love, the recognition of one's worth as an individual is an essentially social matter. You need performativity for that. You need the other for that. And you just can't leave it aside. This is a big lie that you are enough. Uh, what I found very interesting that this idea that you are enough, it has become so fundamental uh, that even the dating platform Match.com, where the above-cited Helen Fisher is uh, working, um, they have published on their webpage um, an advice which seems to be running contradictory to their own commercial interests. Uh, they're suggesting that all this craving love is a cycle that must be stopped as soon as possible. By acknowledging the positive traits about yourself and leaving, uh, learning to live for you eventually, the love craving cycle will end. You will begin to realize that you don't need love from the others to be happy with your life. In the end, you may be surprised when you give yourself real life, so will others. Yulia, can we, can we move to the next slide? Right, so just to put it very shortly, uh, the main premise of the regime of choice is gain with no pain. And uh, the next one. Right. Um, so how do we how do we get <laughs> how how do we get there? And uh, one of the one of the ways to get gain without pain is also to um, describe human relationships, uh, intimacy, attraction, not through the lens of love, but rather through the concept of relationship. So the concept of love in with the regime of choice uh, is gradually being replaced by the concept of relationship. So love is unpredictable. Love happens to you. Love is difficult to articulate. Love can drag you into really, really unpleasant situations. Relationships is something contractual. Relationship is something about equality. Relationships is something about partnership. So in principle, all of us you know, we wouldn't disagree completely that relationship is actually not a bad thing. Um, the question is, how do we actually live it? What do we actually put on it? And how applicable is actually this term in reality to our emotional lives? 
Um, I really like this quote. It's also quite provocative um, from philosopher Alan Bloom, who um, writes in his book, Love and Friendship, that relationships is that pallid cytoscientific word. This way of describing human connection begins from the tentativeness of our attachments. The alleged fact that we're naturally atoms wanting to belong to clusters without the will with all to do so, a situation that would at best make contractual relations possible. Yet one has to have a tin ear to describe on one's great love as a relationship. Did Romeo and Juliet have a relationship? You know, that's a good question. Did they have a relationship? And um, recently I saw a publication about um, Romeo and uh, Juliet, you know, where the author was claiming that actually this is uh, a story of abuse where um, a man is abusing a minor female. It's a story about unsolicited um, kidnapping. It's a story about most likely unsolicited sex, which ends with a double suicide. And uh, this is basically a story of abuse and murder. And it's unclear why should the European civilization still consider it as one of its central love stories. So another interpretation we can all ponder on. Yulia, can we please proceed? So the regime of choice is based um, on a different premise on the, on a, on a, on the opposite um, on the opposite idea of pain with no gain. So you can see here in the picture is uh, um, an illustration to a very famous long um, item of folklore of the Soviet folklore from the 80s. Uh, a joke that uh, Petersburg based uh, artist group Mitki has um, made, a, you know, has made uh, into a sacral status. I cited in my book, it's really long, but basically the story is about uh, a guy who is trying to save a woman and uh, he's just so absolutely incapable of doing it that he just falls into the water and dies. And um, it will take me 15 minutes to tell it to you, so I won't do it right now. But the idea is that you are always prepared uh, for the fact that self-sacrifice will bring no no result. A, you are prepared for self-sacrifice per se, but then even if you are committing self-sacrifice, uh, it probably won't bring you any results. This is a very socialist approach, approach to meta. Um, also, of course, supported by a socioeconomic structure which didn't encourage free competition, which didn't encourage um, any sort of, um, you know, winner and um, winner mentality at least uh, in, uh, in the socioeconomic class, which was producing this kind of um, items of folklore. Uh, Yulia, can we, can we move? Right. So um, the self-sacrifice uh, of the regime of fate, unfortunately, all this, uh, you know, often comes without self-reflection. So if the problem of the regime of choice is that, um, there is too much self-reflection and maybe too little self-sacrifice. And you know, in our parts of the world, self-sacrifice often comes without self-reflection. And um, my colleague Yulia Leana, um, an Israeli sociologist of emotions and anthropologist, conducted a study into ways Russian talk about love. And the purpose of her research was to find out uh, whether, as a result of the communist neoliberal turn, you know, we have started talking more like. Um, you know, like my friend Jesse, and not like uh, the protagonists uh, of uh, Iranian Sudbe. And um, the answer is not not really, not not quite there yet. So she analyzed uh, discussions in various TV talk shows and had conducted interviews um, with um, people in different socioeconomic strata and generation. And she established that to Russians, love still remains a destiny, a moral act and value. It's irresistible. It requires sacrifice, and it implies suffering and pain. And whereas the concept of maturity, which lies at the heart of the regime of choice, regards romantic pain as an aberration and a sign of poor decision making, the Russians consider maturity to be the capacity to bear this very pain, sometimes to an absurd degree. Um, so I suppose that uh, these differences are also very much related to different understanding ideas of freedom. So um, the idea of freedom that is built into the regime of choice is uh, 
the freedom for, you know, the famous definition of the famous um, differentiation of types of freedom made by philosopher Isaiah Berlin, uh, the freedom for and the freedom from. So uh, the positive and the negative freedom. So the freedom of the regime of choices, the so-called positive freedom, where you think that you're making choices for something in order to achieve something, in order to get something. Uh, because you have an idea that, uh, you know, you there is a broad menu of options available to you. And if you just choose the right thing, then you will optimize your life. And step by step, you will at some point achieve, you know, um, you will maximize your stakes and you will get more out of love. And the Russian idea of freedom, which applies also to uh, intimate relationships, which is still very strong in our society, is the freedom from. So when we, uh, when we think about love, very often I think that still um, in the post-Soviet space, we think of love as a space where we can run away from something, you know, and if you look at also at classic Russian literary narratives, at classic Russian cinematographic narratives, it's very often the same story, you know, it's the classic story of the Dr. Zhivago, you know, you run away into the woods and uh, you spend you know, you know that you are that that, that um, you you doomed and you're gloomed, but you still can't help it, and you just give into this, and you run away into love as if love is like a special sacred space where you can where you can drop everything and and go there. And um, this idea is also not completely strange to the Westerners. Uh, Laura Kipnis, who I have cited before, she has a very um, um, second uh, summary of what is happening. She has once said that uh, relationships have become such relentless work that affairs appear to us as holidays. So uh, for the Western society, you know, affair is, uh, is something that, you know, for Russians, maybe love is in general, you know, running your way into something, leaving everything behind and just going into, into somewhere. And here we're talking about different selves also, you know, because this different types of freedom, they're shaped by different types of subjectivity, that they, they are shaped by different idea about what a human being should be capable of doing, um, what their ethical standards should be, and how they should act. And um, I think that we're still, even after 30 years after the demise of the Soviet Union, we're still sort of not quite uh, in the same place where developed capitalist societies are, we still conceive of freedom in a, in a different way. Um, Yulia, can you give us the next slide? Yeah. <clears throat> so there are very, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that the regime of fate necessarily, you know, it may sound more romantic, it may sound more uh, authentic to us, it may sound like an interesting alternative, but we just have to bear in mind that it does have side effects, you know, it doesn't come without, um, comes with a price. So in terms of bulk numbers, Russians have the greatest numbers of uh, marriages, divorces, and abortions per capita than in other developed country. And this statistics document an impetus to act upon emotions, whatever it takes, and often at the cost of one's own comfort. Russian romance is closely accompanied by substance abuse, domestic violence and abandoned children, the byproducts of lives that were never really thought through very clearly. So believing in fate each time you fall in love is not such a great alternative to excessive choice, perhaps. Yeah, did we have the next one? So what can we learn maybe from the regime of fate? You know, if you want to have some takeaways, if you want to uh, bear in your mind, you know, all the difficult, things about it, bearing in mind all the side effects, I think that what we can still um, maybe um, learn from it um, is are three things. First is the acceptance of emotional pain as a normal experience, as a part of the human life. Second is the acceptance of attachment is often irrational and something that we all need and we you know, try to realize it in sometimes in very funny and self-destructive ways. And third is the possibility of self-sacrifice. Um, can I have the last slide? I think it must be the last one. Right, so what is the real alternative? So uh, <laughs> this is an open question, of course, you know, what kind of regime can we offer? 
what, what is what is is there a third way um in my book i'm writing about care as, a, as an alternative you can also maybe talk about attachment you can talk about care or <clears throat> i very much like the idea which i recently came across um in the anthropological <clears throat> book i didn't really expect to come across um it's a fundamental research on the history of death um uh, made by <clears throat> excuse me uh by david graeber <clears throat> uh where he's talking about the baseline communism. And I really like this idea that there is a kind of baseline communism in human relationships. Uh, uh, there is always something, uh, there are in, in our life, there are always situations when we do things without really calculating uh, the stakes, where we act on some self understood um, altruism. For example, if somebody wants to bum a cigarette from you, you probably want to say no. Uh, or if a friend is ill uh, and asks for help, you also probably won't say no. So there are, even in the most capitalist societies, even in the most neoliberal, in the most calculated societies, there are always pockets of relationships which imply some kind of self-understood idea of altruism and care. And I think that this is, this is really important that we look into those pockets of life, that we bring them to light and that we look at them and we we we'll maybe um, put them more into the center of our lives because from there we can really learn and we can maybe extrapolate this based on communism on more types of relationships in our lives. Because if you look at how people are talking about their intimate relationships, uh, when we did interviews this year in Russia, we noticed that uh, people had, you know, our, our interview partners, they seem to be suffering from a very underlying, very fundamental, internal conflict because they actually were talking about needing attachment and needing some form of uh, commitment to each other. They felt like they needed to feel that there was something more than just a mere choice connecting them and, and with the person uh, who they were with, but they were um, unable to allow this for a possibility. It was too dangerous. It was too scary to call this kind of relationships of choice to call them to call them into something more to describe them into something more, and the pressure to calculate uh, the equilibrium in a relationship, the pressure to always maintain in a balance, you know, that I give you this and you give me that, is so exhausting that uh, for many people their love stories just end prematurely because they're just not able to carry on. They prefer to be alone rather than to be perpetually engaged in this calculation of I give you and you give me. Um, so uh, on the one hand, I think it's really, really important that we're starting to think about how do we respect each other to the extent that we remain equal in relationships, that um, we really overcome patriarchy, that we don't play on models where somebody owes something uh, to the other just because of their gender or because of their age or because of their race. And at the same time, I have a sense that we haven't yet arrived to the point where we're comfortable with um, treating people on the on the equal basis. We're still very tense about it. And we're not allowing ourselves uh, to feel attachment because we feel that it can anytime uh, turn into dependence. And dependence is something that we're all really, really terrified of. Dependence is a really, it's a swearing word. Dependence is something that, um, you know, we're being told from the very beginning of our lives now that it's something really terrible and, and something needs to be avoided. And uh, I think that in order to liberate ourselves from this terror of having to be always autonomous, always independent, always having our options of leaving, um, we need to reconsider also this concept of dependence. And for that, the feminist optic is really very appropriate because as feminists very rightly note that uh, a lot of concepts in the history of uh, Western thought are, you know, they are marked by underlying patriarchy and the concept of dependency is a very patriarchal concept, which by definition, you know, is based on a binary position where independence is good, it's male, it's white, you know, it's, uh, it's democratic, it's something wonderful, and dependence is something female, it's something colored, it's something uh, weak and something undemocratic. And from the point of view of feminist optics, what we need to do, we need to rewrite those concepts. We need to rethink how they can 
you know, what kind of meaning they can have. And we need to fill them with new ideas because we can also say that independence uh, can be also, you know, uh, it can be aggression, it can be cooperate, it can be disrespect to other people, whereas dependence is all, also a sign of ability to maintain social relations, to provide care and to be open. So I think that we're now at a point when different regimes of, you know, emotional regimes are clashing in, in, in the Russian society. And maybe this is a great opportunity for us to think the concepts through and find our own way of how we actually, what we want to learn from either of this regime and maybe find a different way, find a third way where we can make sure that we respect each other, but we were yet not afraid of attachment and care. So thanks a lot. And I'm going to finish here and I'm ready for your questions. Questions? Anyone on Zoom? Thank you, Polina. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. So um, what you've talked about are very, um, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, very cisgender, um, heterocentric views, I guess. So do you, um, uh, I guess like the general um, thoughts on the, I guess the, like the homosexual relationships, because I don't think um, like the authors of um, the book that's like, oh, women don't, don't like talk with men, don't like give them the time of day. I don't, or like men see women as like a trophy. Um, I, I think the, like the part is missed where um, there are men who are into men and women who are into women. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I mean, um, I think uh, definitely, you know, in the book, I, I put it very clearly that the material which I have gathered to write this book was uh, based on interviews with heterosexual people. So that was just to make it very clear. Um, I very much hope that we will also have an opportunity to extend our sample and work with, um, with different people, you know, people with different preferences. Uh, and yet, I believe, nevertheless, uh, that there is an interesting paradox about the regime of choice. Um, which maybe allows us to generalize a little bit about um, homo as well as heterosexual and uh, you know the whole spectrum of, of of different sexualities. So what the regime of choice actually gives us, and which is a great thing, and I think we should be all you know well, most of us would probably agree that you know we should be grateful for it, is that we have a very broad spectrum of possible ways of engaging into relationships, and even in a such homophobic and patriarchal country as Russia, uh, middle class, do we have middle class? I mean, educated urban young population is aspiring to the ideal of um, sexual freedoms. And we're aspiring to the ideal of uh, having uh, possibilities of engaging into very different sorts of intimacies, relationships, and sexualities with different people, regardless of their gender, regardless of their age, you know, and. Uh, we are gradually also starting to speak openly about uh, uh, monogamy as being not the only possibility for people to live and uh, experience um, intimacy and, and love. So I think that the spectrum is opening to us very broadly. And of course, the experience of people you know, inside of the spectrum will, will always be very different. Uh, but Nevertheless, I think the paradox is that while all the spectrum is open to us and any of us could potentially, you know, um, choose to do whatever they please, maybe in Russia less than in Germany, where I live, um, there is only one type of subjectivity which is allowed in these relationships. And that is this kind of psychological man that I was talking earlier about. You have to be, you have to be, um, autonomous, you have to declare your sovereignty and you have to appear as a chooser in the first place. And I think this is something that we can observe across different, um, you know, um, 
<laughs> groups of the spectrum. I think this is this is the bottom line that is typical for for everyone is we're talking about the bottom line subjectivity. Yeah, can I add to this? Of course. I think that it's not only about love. There is, you know, there is different in Russian post-Soviet Union space and in, in the West. It's also about friendship and friendship. It is different. It is still self-sacrifice and dependence to a certain extent. And this concept, the concept of friendship is kind of, is more gender indifferent. So we can see it not only in heterosexual relationship, it's just something, something else. And I would, I would say that it's also about parental relationship, which are maybe different, but they're more similar, I think, all over the world because children are dependent. They're supposed to be dependent. They, it's not possible for them to be independent. They mm -hmm. physiologically, they are dependent. But yeah, it's not only about heterosexual, it's about uh, some, something else. It's about those pure regimes of maybe sociality that are uh, you know, embodied in different forms, including the heterosexual patriarchal type, of, uh, but also in different other types of sociality of human connections. Alisa has a question, right? Yes. Thank you very much for your lecture. I have a question about this moving from the importance from person who is loved to the person who loves. Mm -hmm. uh, may I use Russian for citation Polina's book? Of course, <laughs> I mean, I don't mind. <laughs> Julia has to decide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, it is page 11. А, и тут лукавый ухаживатель, он высказал острую мысль. Любящий где ближе к божеству, чем любимый, ибо из этих двоих только в нем живет Бог. При тонкую мысль, самую насмешливую всех, когда-либо приходивших на ум человеку. Мысль, от которой взялось начало всего лукавства, всего тайного сладострастия, любовной тоски. Это наблюдение из смерти в Венеции символизирует фундаментальную трансформацию в понимании природы любви, которая случилась в конце 19-го, начале 20-х веков. Switch to English again. <laughs> Plato in uh, his symposium uh, that dates approximately, I think, uh, 400 years BC, 400 BC, um, in the part of Phaedrus, uh, the third speaker claims the same idea. Uh, he writes that uh, the person who loves uh, is more divine because he is uh, inspired by gods. So my question is, how does it correlate or what is the difference? It's very hard to answer for me. I, I don't really know, to be honest. It's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. So first and foremost, thank you for letting me know. Um, I need to find this um, quote and look at it. But um, I think that kind of, you know, antiquity is sort of exists, exists before the Christian understanding of subjectivity. So if we're looking at the Christianity, uh, at, if we're looking at the development of ideas about subjectivity from the, from the um, beginning of Christianity, then we can see maybe this uh, development in a more linear way, the way I describe it, um, where you know, the, uh, um, the focus is moving gradually from uh, the gaze into the outwards, the gaze into the divine, the gaze, in, 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 the gaze into the transcendental, which is, you know, turns more and more in, inwards, turns more and more uh, towards the subject. Um, antiquity is uh, kind of somewhat outside of this um, period of development, uh, but I, I would definitely, it's, it's just, I can't really answer this question right now. I have to think about it. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I need to see if, like what kind of, um, what kind of correlations there are and whether Plato's idea, this idea has actually been adopted uh, um, consciously by any thinkers later in, throughout the development of the Christian thought about love. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. I think also the problem can be in translation because uh, I became interested in this question and in the Russian mm -hmm. version and in English version, there is a little bit different translation of this idea. You mean Plato or? Uh, Plato, Plato. Plato. Okay. Um, would be, do you mind, uh, do you mind sending me the quote maybe per mail? Uh, you yes, can have of course. From, from Julia. Or I can just put it in the chat, I think, you know, so if any of you would be interested in, keep 
pick and touch. I certainly don't mind. I don't know. Yeah, do you hear me well? Yes. Thank you for the presentation and lecture. I wanted to ask about um, conditions which might change our region of choice or of attachment. I just saw uh, while I listened to you about uh, recent COVID-19 pandemia, mm -hmm. pandemic. And I suppose this pandemic like largely shows us that sometimes we do not have um, even a possibility of choice. For example, being at home or not being at home mm -hmm. uh, during lockdown and etc. And I wanted to ask, may it also affect our psychology of emotions? Like may cause uh, changes in our region of um, I don't know how to put it, like building our relationship or finding love and etc. Um, I think that the situation of lockdown has made a lot of people face their own loneliness. Uh, the, the pressure um, for self-isolation, I think it became a situation where people faced their loneliness in very different situations. And uh, on the basis of how they actually experience this loneliness, uh, different people took different action because uh, you can feel very lonely in a marriage or in a stable relationship as well. And, um, you know, in couples where this feeling has become unbearable, during the lockdown, many couples broke up. So actually, uh, every um, kind of social turmoil, every social uh, crisis always brings uh, higher breakup and divorce rates into societies. And we've already seen it in China that uh, after the lockdown, um, the divorce rate has really skyrocketed there. And we're going to see it also in Europe and in Russia, I'm sure. Uh, we might not have uh, some very reliable data because a lot of these relationships are informal, we won't know, but we will might see it uh, through proxy data, like, you know, changes in the real estate market, et cetera. So um, on top of that, of course, there are also really borderline situations when people are experiencing, uh, experiencing domestic violence, and then there is just real pressure to leave. But for many people, it's not so urgent it's just it's the feeling of not being able not having space uh, not having uh, enough um, uh, not, not being really accepted not really being in a relationship actually while sharing the same premises with the other person and here you're facing your own loneliness and you're actually going out of this relationship you're actually making yourself maybe uh, more lonely in order to feel more comfortable and other people who have lived alone, who you know never had any intention of living with someone else, they face the loneliness in a different way. They realize that their singlehood is no longer bringing them all the joys that they have been, you know, used to. Or they were counting on. And for these people, the lockdown has become a reason to move in with somebody, even if though you know they didn't really plan on it. Um, so for me, I think the most interesting result of conversations with um, different people in, in different situations and life stages was the uh, impression that the pandemic was sort of like, it's like a carte blanche for expressing attachment on very different levels. It gave uh, a lot of people permission to be vulnerable and to actually speak openly about uh, needing someone else. And, you know, it gets expressed on very different levels. And the first wave of the lockdown um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of people observed that there was a wave of, of comebacks. You know, uh, women all over the place, mostly women, on social media reported that their exes are just coming one after the other, one after the other, asking, "How are you? How are you? How are you? Is everything all right?" You know, people who from who you wouldn't have heard for many years, they suddenly all line up uh, to just give a sign of life. It doesn't mean that they actually want a relationship with you, but they there is a sign of care out there, at least on a symbolic level, at least on a performative level. Um, also, 
I did some, made some interviews with people who actually moved in during lockdown uh, without having any intention to do that before. And uh, I spoke to people in different generations uh, from you know 25 year olds to 65 year olds in different parts of the world who all said the same thing. You know, We thought that it is so important to be autonomous. We were really believing in this value of sovereignty. We never thought that moving in is a good idea because we didn't want to depend on each other. We didn't want dependency. But when actually, you know, shit hit the fan and we had to do it because otherwise we would be separated by state borders or by lockdown borders. When we did it, it actually turned out uh, that, it's a, it's, that it's actually great, you know, that, that it's really good to have somebody around, somebody who you can rely on and just have somebody who you can just, you know, like in, in, <laughs> in the very film that was I cited in the beginning of the lecture, somebody's just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it's actually, it actually can be quite enjoyable. And people were very surprised by their capacity to enjoy that as if they have, you know, hypnotized themselves into the idea that uh, singledom solitude is the only appropriate socially, socially appropriate way of living and then suddenly it's not you know maybe there is a different way thank you for your answer thank you is there anyone else um, hello thank you for your presentation uh, uh, i have a few connected questions um first uh, how do people in a regime of choice, actually control themselves and uh, how uh, it happens that uh, they can choose uh, what to do, <laughs> laugh or not to laugh, and uh, um, if uh, they cannot choose, uh, so in this regime, uh, do people think that love is uh, bad and feelings are bad and uh, uh, that's the first part and uh, the second part uh, what is uh, more damaging which regime uh, of this i don't know if this question is for you or for me maybe uh, which of these regimes um, is more damaging for people and people's mental health, like, mm. seems like the one that, that we choose uh, because we we try to avoid abusive uh, uh, relationships, dependency, uh, but if we avoid feelings, it may not be good either and what is more bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. To answer the first question, how do people control themselves? You know, I think um, all of us probably have at some point in our lives encountered somebody who preferred to break up with us. And maybe we were ourselves, you know, the initiators of this breakup when they felt too much, they felt like they started attaching too much. And this is something I also hear in the interviews. This is something I read all the time in uh, um, discussion boards and groups on Facebook where people discuss their personal relations that it's, it's a very frequent experience that uh, when you uh, feel that you start developing in your own understanding in your own measure too much attachment for somebody, then maybe it's time to actually break up with them. So as not to make it dangerous. Uh, you know, mental health specialists and psychologists, and Julie you can correct me if I'm wrong, often call it uh, avoidant attachment type. So, uh, and in fact, for uh, a mental health specialist, avoidant attachment type is actually a kind of, you know, it's not necessarily um, a pathology, but it's, um, um, it's a kind of like a damaging approach to, to human relationships. And people with you know, uh, avoiding attachment type, they, uh, from the point of view of, um, of a mental health specialist, they need support, they need help, they need, you know, guidance in how to start trusting other people and trusting themselves. But uh, the joke is that uh, societally, you know, in a point in, in, where we are right now, in our historical point, you know, in our neoliberal, uberized 
society, avoidant attachment type is actually uh, the most socially legitimate one. It's the one that actually permits us to, to gain most from life. Uh, this is the experience that we're making all the time, um, you know, in very different spheres of life. The quicker you can move from one project to the other, the quicker you can leave behind something that is not, you know, bringing you the gains that you expected or that you're feeling that you're getting stuck with some project for, so, for too long, you know, you have to force yourself to get out of that because it's too risky to stay in one place where, you know, our labor market alone, our educational market alone is, um, is conditioning us into the idea that we never have to attach. Attachment is dangerous. Attachment means that we will grow stale and we will become unattractive on the market. And the same idea applies to uh, to the romantic market, to, to the market of partnerships. Um, so this is one way of controlling, for example, uh, forcefully quitting relationships, which start becoming too close. It, you know, it sounds uh, absurd, but you know, I'm sure that all of us have made this experience in our lives. Um, um, also, there are plenty of techniques about how to control yourself and how to control your relationship. You know, there are uh, libraries of self-help books written about that. There are blogs written about that. There's plenty out there, you know, starting from give, you, give each other one hug a day, uh, you know, and uh, write a journal about how many hugs you gave and, uh, you know, uh, and every day uh, estimate on the scale from one to 10, how you felt about your relationship. You know, those are very typical advices that couples therapists give uh, to their clients. And uh, I have recently heard from somebody, um, from a very young person who went on a Tinder date. And after the date was, you know, after it was over and uh, uh, they were partying the young man has asked her uh, to estimate him as a as a date also on a scale from zero to ten so uh, these practices are actually out there you know people are relying on them in their everyday life quite a lot um the second question what is more dangerous what is more harmful what is more dangerous you know i think that uh, as i said in the very beginning like uh there is no social ideal, like there is no utopia where uh, we can all move into, move to. I mean, uh, we can think about how we, um, I think the important thing uh, for us is to understand, is to live without illusions. And I think what is dangerous about the regime of choice is that we have a lot of illusions about it. Maybe about the regime of fate, you know, the therapeutic discourse, the therapeutic turn has, uh, given us a lot of instruments and has given us a lot of discourse about why it's dangerous. You know, every new year we're reading about why Ironia Sudbi is terrible and nobody should ever watch it because we're getting wrong ideas about what love is. You know, basically speaking the same words as my friend Jesse said 30 years ago, that uh, 20 years ago, that it's just a lot of poor choices. Don't do that, don't do that, this is really bad. So we are sort of aware about dangers which come with this package. You know, we don't want to end up on the, on the cargo train like Anna Karenina, we know that this kind of approach to love can lead us into a very unpleasant situations. But the problem with the regime of choice is that we're still, at least in the Russian speaking setting, we haven't developed enough critique to strip ourselves of illusions about it. And I think the idea that it brings a gain without pain is wrong, 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 and wrong again. And love hurts. And this is what Eva Luz is writing, and this is what I think it's super important to understand that if we start believing in the idea that we can just, um, you know, um, take romantic pain, take uh, the, the pain of love uh, as a pathology and that we can cure ourselves from it, we are going to end up in a very bad place as well. It's not going to be much better than the cargo train because we are going to end up in a place where suffering is delegitimized, where you always have to be you know, positively thinking and where you're always the author of your own trouble. And if something is not going well in your life, that always means that you have just not thought about your choices well enough and you are responsible. And in the end effect, there is no such thing as society as Margaret Thatcher has put it. And in the end effect, there is no such thing as other people. There is only you and your poor choices. And this is a very, very lonely place to be. And I think that this is the danger where we're heading to. And um, my job is to speak about it. 
Can I ask for this too? Thank you. Yeah, so the question is uh, what is more detrimental? First of all, I agree with Lopkowski that, <laughs> that love is illness, right? Uh, the love that hurts is illness, but at, at the same time, it's an Ill illness that defines human. So without it, we wouldn't be humans at all. So human are embodiment of illness and human evolution is kind of the stage where we transformed into human is the stage where we got ill and it's not with no way to heal the illness that's the problem so humans are tragic creatures in evolution we can talk about remember the, the neotomy i was talking about that we always stay uh, not mature and in psychoanalysis we would say that we have this um, the need of the attachment figure that could never be satisfied. So we need someone so much and it's impossible to satisfy, so it hurts all the time. And this is what defines us as human, this is what keeps us together. And what um, Paulina said about the communist, communism ideal that is always human, that humanity is always articulating, I do agree with that. So we can, from this perspective, we can also see capitalism as a way to embody this and all the social regimes as a way to embody this communism so capitalism sometimes is defined as the communism that went wrong as, as, or as socialism that went wrong. It's just a way to, to make it more bearable, right? The communism as such, I mean, the, the human proximity embodied in a perfect world, it, it hurts, it's impossible to bear. So we are trying to manage it. We're trying to find a way to embody it in such a way that it will be bearable. And in this way, so everything is detrimental for your mental health but in a different ways. Um, the contemporary disfasting regime is still detrimental in its own way. Russian regime may be more in a more intense way because of the terrible consequences, but it's still it's just a different way to manage it. And maybe, and we'll never find out the perfect way to, to, to make law um, not painful because as you remember Krishna showing you Lieberman, and Paulina is writing about Lieberman, and we all love Lieberman, <laughs> so, although we don't agree with him because, uh, in a way, because we do agree with him, we don't agree with him. The way he presents law is that it makes us happy. Well, it does make us happy sometimes when we feel it, but at the same time, we only feel it as a pain because we need someone. If you don't feel a pain of attachment, you don't feel love. So love is still as pain, and this is what defines us as humans. So unfortunately, <laughs> There are different medicines cure, but not to cure the love, just to make it bearable, right? To to make it uh, compatible with life. So, and I would recommend, of course, it it maybe it's better in our society to to love in a way it's still uh, recognizable. It's easier to love in a, in a way it's recognizable by society because if you were trying to be the self-sufficient, strong woman. At least you will get the help. It's easier to get the help from society. Society will support you. Psychologists will support you. Lobkowski <laughs> will support you, right? And other, but at the same time, uh, it's also better to be revolutionaries, right? To uh, to go for any crazy and tragic types of law. Because in this way, it's, it gives a way for other people to question it and you start to experiment with it. So it depends. If you want to survive for longer, you can practice normal law if you want to, to to change the world. You can do the you can risk yourself and try try other types of you know, of attachment and engagement, right, Polina? I fully agree. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, I have a question. So uh, when you oops, it's <laughs> Do you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk, Polina? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, technical tragedy. Tragedies. Uh, I have a question regarding the examples you provide to. Uh, describe the uh, uh, regime of fate. So you rely on Russian literature, Tolstoy, uh, you mentioned Pasternak, and we, we can add Pushkin and 
someone else there. And uh, I think that uh, at least I have heard that these authors are widely recognized uh, on the West. And to, uh, to this, I can add that maybe there are a lot of uh, uh, movies or soap operas uh, exactly in the United States which show the nostalgia for the romantic uh, type of love. And uh, uh, my question is, uh, why do you think that this categorization on Western and Eastern or Russian uh, works? Uh, why don't you suggest to categorize these uh, types uh, just ideologically? That there is neoliberal ideology and it comes to Russia and these uh, partner relationships uh, will be widely recognized here if it goes the same way and on the contrary in the west there are examples of uh, nostalgia for romantic love but this is just competing ideologies well uh, William Reddy is writing uh, when he writes about the emotional regimes he also introduces the concept of um, <clears throat> oh god what is it called in English um, emotional hideaway, or I'll say it in Russian, emotional убежище. So emotional убежище, or hideaway, it's a, it's a specific pocket of interaction where you are free to present yourself in a different way, uh, in a way that is different from the outside space, outside society. So it's a, it's a place where you use different emotives, you know, the way he talks about it, um, and where you can uh, be sure that uh, it's, 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 it's an enclosed space where you are uh, understood and taken for who you are uh, under certain conditions. And, um, you know, every society has this kind of uh, <clears throat> emotional hideaways or, you know, emotional um, убежище. And I think in a way uh, for um, the new liberal emotional culture for what you can call uh, emotional capitalism, because emotional capitalism doesn't necessarily have to be neoliberal, but in, uh, you know, in the course of development of emotional capitalism, it also has developed together along with different pockets of these um, emotional hideaways. And definitely also in the American culture, uh, such hideaways exist. And uh, for example, also for a long time, we saw that romantic comedies were a genre which allowed for this uh, type of, uh, Hideaway. It was still allowed, and if we look at the recent romantic comedies, which are really block, you know, making making it into blockbusters, we can see that this is changing. They're also changing their tone. You know, they're really uh, the 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 blockbuster that made, uh, you know, that, that became probably the most popular a few years ago is How to Be Single, for example. This is a real uh, example of uh, a rom com that fully adopts the idea of uh, independent. A sovereign individual who is actually happy because she's not looking for a couple. She is not looking for somebody. It's it, it's actually really ideological, ideological films like made in the best traditions of social realism, where you really they're really really uh, rubbing it on very very thickly to show you uh, what they think. And um, love songs, for example, has have uh, pop music has for a long time also remained like an outpost of. Um, uh, idea of love as fate. Pop music is also changing in a way, you know, it also starts operating with notions uh, um, from therapeutic culture. It also takes a different approach. You know, if you listen to uh, modern singers, they take on love is also very, very different. You know, they no longer sing like, you know, the tradition of blues is <laughs> no longer that prominent out there. It's, it's not that legitimate to reproduce uh, those ideas. So these pockets are gradually disappearing a little bit. And when it comes to represent representations of Russian culture, it's I think it's a classical case of uh, cultural othering. So you have the other uh, who is legitimately show you uh, the alternative, but you will never live the same way. You know, it's it's, it's cosplays. It's the counts and and uh, and the princesses who are you know um, singing Soviet songs uh, uh, in the nineteenth century. You know, it's a, it's like it's a, uh, it's a, it's an imaginary world. It's a Disney fairy tale where this kind of things happen because these people can do it, but we can't. It's it's another reminder that we are not like them. Uh, I think it only accentuates the difference between uh, the perceived us and the perceived them. Okay, so 
may uh, yeah. uh, and if if you claim that uh, the difference is ideological and uh, uh, it influences pop culture and pop culture changing uh, can we uh, assume or predict that in russia in few years or decades if neoliberalism or just capitalism will remain the pre prevailing ideology russian pop culture will change as well or there is something essential in russian culture in radical yeah and uh, that it will be will be always there i think that it is already changing i mean um definitely you know manetochka is not the same thing as zimfira totally um and i think that uh this kind of uh, pockets uh, are also appearing, you know, all over the place where people are trying to build, sort of, to uh, to find a space where it's legitimate to suffer. Like the documentary theater, for example, I think is one of the most bright examples of how this is being done. Also in Russia, I think, like in and probably in, in many post-Soviet places, um, um, the socially socially legitimate ways of uh, showing care and attachment are, are currently, I have a sense that they are pushed um, towards um, some kind of like charity and NGO activities. And I think that a lot of political activism in Russia, a lot of civil society activism is very much based on people's need to live this baseline communism as, as Greb, David Graeber is, writing about it. So we had people who told us in the interviews of, you know, about the different things that they do in their life and the way they talk about their civic activism, you know, those who do engage into civic activism is very, very different from how they talk about their relationships. Because in the, in the context of civic activism, they actually really, they committed and uh, they are passionate and, and there is a way of ex channeling this desire to give without calculation to, to uh, you know, to not invest into a relationship, but actually just, you know, take a risk of going into something and putting yourself uh, as a vulnerable person out there. Uh, but it's socially legitimate to a sense because uh, this is also accentuates the position of an autonomous individual. You know, I'm out there, I chose to fight for freedom or I chose to help children with um, disabilities or I chose to save rivers, uh, God knows what, but when it comes to relationships between two adult individuals, it becomes very, very difficult uh, to actually live this desire for, uh, for this altruism. It's, it's kind of like, you know, there is a sense of self-imposed uh, ban on doing that. And, and, and I had a sense that this is where the very strong internal conflict is coming from. Thank you very much. We need to let them go and we're letting you go. Thank you so much. <laughs> you are very laconic, my dear. <laughs> yeah, I'll see some of you on Wednesday and we're going to discuss Polina's book without her. <laughs> Thank you, Polina. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you very much for the impression. It was a pleasure. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.